Hello, my name is Ted Corliss. For the last 25 years, I've been a property insurance lawyer practicing all over the United States. You know, a lot of times we get into arguments about windows or doors or roofs that are damaged by windstorms or whether or not that crack in that wall may be associated with a sinkhole either under the property or nearby. But I can tell you as a property insurance lawyer, there's nothing sadder than to hear of a building collapse that has resulted in the loss of life. You know, this morning at the Chaplin Towers South Building, located in Surfside, Florida, a building has collapsed, uh, the Chaplin Towers South Building specifically. And I can tell you as of the recording of this podcast, the number of deaths remains unknown. The number of missing have been counted just at 100. Now, what we know so far is that this building was built in 1981, and it consists of two and three bedroom units. There's 136 of them contained within a 12-story structure. Now, one of the things that I'm going to show you in just a moment is a video that was captured by a camera in the immediate area. But before I get to that, I want to state a very specific purpose for this podcast. What we're going to be doing over the next 48 hours is consulting with various professionals that are highly relevant to the issue of what has occurred and what the future looks like for the families associated with this loss. I bring again to you my 25 years of experience as a property insurance lawyer in Florida, handling virtually every kind of peril that can destroy a building. Anything from sinkholes to windstorms to water to missiles, to airplanes, anything that will bring a building down, we've been involved with it. When you look at the video, one of the things I want you to focus on is the area that appears to collapse first. But here, a warning to you, this is a very shocking video. So we're going to take a moment here and I'm going to show you the property as recorded this morning. Now, as you can notice, the center core of the building appears to collapse first. Now, one of the, there's going to be reasons why that's relevant because of us understanding the history of this particular building. This particular building, it turns out, had been the subject, it's being reported, of a 2020 report showing that there had been, from the 1990s, two millimeters, that's all, two millimeters a year of movement downward in this particular structure. Now, we're going to be able to hear from engineers that are going to describe to you why that's relevant. And so obviously, the very first issue we have to address for this particular property is the forensics. As you can imagine from similar collapses like this, the forensics are exponentially more complex. And the reason for that is you must remember that there has been at least one recorded death at this particular location. That means that this is a crime scene just as the Murrah building, the Alfred Murrah building in Oklahoma City was a crime scene, just like the towers uh, that were brought down on 9-11 in 2001 was a crime scene. We have to understand uh, how they're going to be gathering all of the data to understand how this building collapsed, because you can imagine one of the reasons why it is so much more complex to be dealing with this is that the remaining structure is highly variable, highly unstable, which means that the investigation into what brought the building down and how that occurred will be more difficult because the investigators have to be concerned about their own personal safety as they conduct their investigation. Relevant to that, when the particular building collapsed, the report is that more than 80 people were trapped within the boundaries of the remaining structure. And that those people, majority of those people, I understand, as of today, as of now, as of late, have been recovered from the property. But the question remains, how is it that the forensics can safely investigate, as they're obligated to do, 
the the area when, of course, the first focus has to be on identifying survivors. Now, we, of course, wish and hope for the very, very best. But I must say that if we consider the success of prior collapses, the Oklahoma City bombing being one, or the 9-11 towers, talking about the World Trade Center coming down, the total number of survivors was unfortunately dismal, uh, to say the very least. And in this context, there isn't. there are even nearby buildings that have been damaged. So the breadth of the damage and the impact that this may have had on the community is yet to be discovered. But what we're going to be doing here in the next, like I said, 48 hours and publishing all of these podcasts at the same time uh, is we're going to be presenting an engineer, a structural engineer, a professor of engineering at USF, who is going to be able to come in and talk to us about uh, what the possible explanations for this could be. And then after that, we're going to be able to spend some time with some of the insurance professionals who understand how to assess the loss that arises from a tragic event like this. And we're going to be bringing in an individual who has a lot of experience, more than 20 plus years uh, experience, uh, more than that, in a, taking a property like this and presenting it to insurance companies. And there will be many insurance companies involved in this particular matter, not just the insurance company that would have, in fact, insured the Chaplin Tower South Condominium Association that owns that building. There will be insurance companies for all of the individuals that have been involved in the construction, renovation, and subsequent investigation of this building as late as, as I mentioned, 2020. So understanding those issues will be relevant not only to this property, but also to those of you out there who are involved in these kinds of properties, condominiums. For example, large, tall condominiums, or like we have clients in my law firm that are not in one building, they may be in 40 or 100 or even more than that. But they are all associated with the same insurance policies and the same competing interests when these kinds of events occur, these kinds of losses occur. Our focus always remains on the loss of life, but we do have to get around to the business of this because of the impact it will have on so many families. And so during the time period in the production of this material, we're going to be providing those kinds of details to you. Now let's jump right into the issue of the insurance issues. What would be the very first issue? Well, we use the word collapse uh, because that's obviously what happened, but we also use the word collapse because that's how insurance companies would describe an event like this. They have a wide vocabulary of how they can discuss settlement or movement of soils or breaking of foundations, anything like that. But when they describe an event like this, they even go so far as to you know, tell you how bad it has to be. You know, you'll, uh, so what I've done is I've gathered up one of the, the most common definitions that are provided in these kinds of insurance policies. And the coverage for collapse indicates that they will pay for the collapse of portions of the building or the entire building if it in fact collapses. But here's the important element that people need to understand. And that is that insurance policies for collapse are specific peril issues, which means it isn't the collapse that is covered. It's yes, the collapse is covered, but what ultimately triggered the collapse to occur. And in the context of most of these insurance policies, they are specific peril collapse provisions, which means it matters what caused the building to collapse. Now, right now we know virtually nothing about the forensics. We know that reports have come out of forensic work that, that had been done and had identified an issue in the movement of the foundation. But what caused that foundation to move? For example, if it were a sinkhole, if in fact there were sinkhole coverage and this was a sinkhole loss, certainly there would be potential coverage there. That's specific to sinkhole. Then there's the specific issue of what the insurance policies refer to as hidden decay. That would be a situation where you have a building that is an older building resting on particular wooden members, you know, cross beams in some kind of crawl space environment where the individual 
timber begins to rot because of wood destroying organisms. It can be obviously termites are the most obvious, but there's all kinds of horrible, nasty things in Florida that love to consume wood because of the massive amount of uh, fiber in it. And so if you have a hidden decay of that as a result of insect damage or other reasons, that might very well be covered. There are some other examples, uh, but I will tell you that the vast majority of these are very narrow, and there's going to be a, a dogfight in this particular claim, in the Chaplin Towers South Building claim, with what the cause of this damage was. And the reason for that is because most of the time, these kinds of events are not isolated to one particular element. They are usually a combination of elements, or what we refer to as concurrent causes. And so that will be the likely coverage issue for the building itself. But at the same time, we also have to remember that the responsibilities of the engineers and the contractors are now going to be fly specked for anything that may have triggered them to have warned individuals that this building was in a state of imminent collapse, was in a state of dangerous condition, as the Florida Building Code likes to refer to it as, but specifically, what was the nature of the repairs and were they happening in a timely manner? Again, we are asking more questions now than we have answers, but at the same time, what I want to provide to you is what our forecast is for how we're going to be addressing this issue. So again, we're going to be bringing in a professor of engineering to talk about the forensics and likely causes of these damages. We're going to be bringing in insurance professionals who are going to be raising flags about particular issues that need to be addressed likely immediately. And then we're going to talk about the legal issues, of course. Mostly the focus here will be on the property damage, but of course, the tremendous loss of life that has occurred will certainly be an issue that we will want to dis discuss as well. And so where are you going to find this content? You're going to find it on my YouTube channel of CorliceBarfield.com, or you can flip over to SoundCloud if you just care to listen. Now, on the YouTube channel, we will have copies of all of the various documents that have been filed with the county for this particular property. And we're going to already be fly specking these materials to see if we can determine what at least the professionals associated with this particular building believed needed to be remediated. I can assure you that upon advice of counsel, most of the individuals at any, in any way associated with this building had better be seeking competent counsel and keeping their comments to themselves. But nonetheless, we're going to see what information is available in the public record to give that to you. And I, th I hope that what I'm really going to be telling you is that, you know, those of you who know who we are, we are a law firm that is very focused on the interests of people living in a multi-community environment. Most of our clients have, are, are volunteers. They are, they're unpaid volunteers on boards of directors all over the state of Florida and they are there to support the people who live in that community. And they do the very best that they can. And that can be very challenging either because of the circumstances of their building or most, most of the time, the circumstances of the individuals who demand too much from them and live in the community. And so we support those individuals with the majority of our work being in the representation of multi-unit buildings that have these kinds of complex insurance issues. And so, uh, you can go to our website at corlessbarfield.com to find this content because we believe it's important for people who live in the HOA world, the LCAM world, the Licensed Community Association Manager world, to be aware of these resources. And for those of you who may be involved in these particular issues, we're going to be offering these resources to you in the event they can make your life just a little bit easier. My name again is Ted Corliss with the Corliss Barfield Trial Group. Visit us at corlissbarfield.com or go to our YouTube channel. Be well.